Now it's time for our Austin Ideas interview. University of Virginia professor Richard Rorty is considered one of the most influential philosophers in the United States. We had the good fortune of visiting with Dr. Rorty when he was in town recently for a meeting with Austin Interfaith. Dr. Rorty talked with guest host Noel McAfee, a graduate student of philosophy and associate editor of the Kettering Review, the journal of the, Fetter the Kettering Foundation. Uh, in my area, I'm, I study philosophy, and in my area, you're one of the most famous people in this country, if not in the world, who practices philosophy. Uh, but it's kind of funny because uh, the New York Times quoted, uh, has a little qu quotes under the New York Times said in 1990 about you. They said, Richard Rorty has become the most influential contemporary American philosopher by not offering any philosophy, that is, at least in the traditional sense. It's kind of funny. I mean, they're saying that you do mm -hmm. philosophy, but you don't really offer any. Do you think that this is a, a fair assessment at all? I, I can sort of see what they mean. There's a traditional conception of philosophy as exemplified by people like Plato and Kant, who uh, are thought of as putting, fo putting foundations under human life or social institutions or traditions or something. Uh, and in that sense, I'm, you know, since I don't think philosophy can provide foundations, I guess I'm not doing philosophy. There's another sense of philosophy in which it's just talking about how things in general hang together. And in that sense, practically any intellectual counts as a philosopher. And what I do is mainly talking about the way in which various philosophical ideas have worked on culture in recent times. And in terms of what your philosophy might be, I, I think you'd call it pragmatism. Uh, yeah, I, I like to think that I'm a follower of Dewey. Um, what I like about Dewey was that he sort of asked himself, what, what can philosophy do for American democracy instead of saying, what's the philosophical foundation for democracy? And I think of Dewey as asking, given that we're American Democrats, what would be the appropriate thing for us to say about traditional philosophical topics like truth, knowledge, rationality, and so on. That seems to me the right spirit to go about So what can philosophy do for American democracy? Um, mainly, I think, just uh, break through the crust of convention, as Dewey put it. Um, for example, uh, it's often said you got to have firm moral principles, otherwise, you know, you're a relativist, irrationalist, and so on. Dewey was always accused of being a relativist and irrationalist because he didn't have firm moral principles. He, in modern jargon, I suppose you'd call him a situation ethics person. Uh, his line was, principles are all very well as sort of reminders of social practices, but they can't justify social practices. Nothing can justify a social practice except the consequences of... Well, you know. What would be an example of that? That's kind of an abstract way of, of uh, talking. Well, th think about something like abortion. Um, you try to figure out where you stand on abortion. Kant tells you human life is sacred. You must never do anything to impugn human dignity. That inclines you to respect the fetus as a human life. Mill tells you to maximize human happiness, which suggests you ought to allow abortion on demand. There you are, stuck between Mill and Kant. Uh, what people do is work out some wishy-washy compromise, like, you know, okay, the fetus isn't human until three months or something. Nobody has any, you know, argument why the fetus isn't human until three months. It's just, you know, it's just the kind of compromise people can live with. And Dewey was a philosopher who said, yeah, that's the way it ought to work. And, you know, that's that kind of wishy-washy compromise is okay. It's what you'd expect in a democracy. And if it looks unprincipled, okay, it mm -hmm. looks unprincipled. And so, practically speaking, how do you know whether it's okay? Um, I think Dewey's only test is, uh, does an educated, informed public find it acceptable? <laughs> uh, Jürgen Habermas, the, sort of the German equivalent of Dewey nowadays, says that, you know, and so far as you can give a definition of truth, it's what's arrived at in the ideal communication situation, where the ideal communications situation means something like uh, educated people, informed people, not threatened by anything, not harassed, um, talking to one another, listening to each other's point of view, hashing things over endlessly. 
Dewey and Habermas are both saying, if that doesn't arrive at the truth, you know, nothing ever mm -hmm. will. So if we take care of education and political freedom, truth will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. What I like about Dewey is the suggestion that there's nothing that a democratic community is answerable to except itself. Yeah, it's, it's when you get it, when you get into practical situations, it gets really sticky. I was at a, a deliberative opinion poll in England um, several years ago, and the topic under consideration was crime. And uh, in England, they're opposed to the. I mean, the government says no death penalty. There's no death penalty. The people in England were ready to bring it back. They want to start flogging criminals. Mm -hmm. They're really upset about what the state of the country, the economy, what's the threats at the door. They want to do something about it. And even though during the course of this reasoned dialogue for a couple, three days, uh, they became a little bit more open-minded and not ready to throw everybody in prison, yeah. they were still all for the death penalty, wanting yeah. to bring it back. And, you know, if Habermas is right here, if, you know, whatever they come to is true, I mean, in terms of a, a moral judgment, is that uh, true, that yeah. they ought to bring back the death penalty? Yeah, it's... And that, that's a very good way of putting the problem. I mean, Habermas and Dewey are going to have to say, okay, they're not yet sufficiently informed, not yet sufficiently educated, but of course that begs all the questions. <laughs> I mean, how do you know when that is sufficient? Are they only sufficiently informed when they agree with you? The death penalty, in, as far as I know, has never actually been abolished in any country by popular demand. The, it's been abolished always from on mm -hmm. top because the educated classes have decided they can't stand it anymore. The uneducated classes are, you know, they think it's fine. Uh, Here we are in Texas where I think it's 98% of the people are in favor of the death penalty, yeah. many of whom are educated, so it gets tough. I mean, we're yeah. deciding how to ground a moral judgment, really. But, okay, let's go back to pragmatism. Do you think pragmatism can make people better citizens? I think it can do something to um, give them confidence in themselves. If you think of the Enlightenment of the 18th century and the secularization produced by the Enlightenment as a period in which people were told, look, there isn't a source of authority, not the kings, not the priests, uh, you're just going to have to work it out for yourselves. I think of pragmatism as carrying through on the Enlightenment and saying, um, you know, human beings are alone in the universe. Uh, they're, they can't look outside themselves either for comfort or for principles or for inspiration. Uh, they're at their best when they work together. Um, so I think of pragmatism as sort of an extension of the secularism and rationalism of the Enlightenment. One way to think of it is the Enlightenment said, now that we have the scientists, we don't need the priests. Uh, do we was saying, don't think of the scientists as replacing the priests. Don't think that, you know, the priests claim to be in touch with God, the scientists claim to be in touch with reality. There's no such thing as reality to be in touch with. Truth isn't correspondence to reality. Truth is simply what gets human beings what they want, and in particular, what gets democratic communities what they want. So. If you think of Enlightenment rationalism as having elevated science above religion, you can think of pragmatism as saying, don't elevate anything above anything. Just treat, you know, treat, don't treat any area of culture as the place where you get the last word from, because nobody's going to give you any last word. Mm -hmm. You've been maligned from both the right and the left. You're sort of this strange position of being kind of... Um, not making anybody happy. The rightists said, you've, and this is your, these are your words, the rightist thinkers don't think that it is enough just to prefer democratic societies. One also has to believe that they are objectively good. Um, now, while I'm hardly on the right, I do see some merit in saying that some kinds of societies are better than others, and that it's not just because I happen to be born into one that I happen to like my own. So I mean, it seems like the, the, this claim that you're pointing out that the right is making is, has some validity. Well. In, in my capacity as a philosophy professor, I, I resist it because I don't think anybody has ever explained what objectively right means. I mean, we all know what better or worse right and wrong means, but when you throw in objectively, it seems to me it's just a way of patting yourself on the back or, you know, banging on the table. 
Uh, nobody knows what it would be to have an objective inquiry into the relative merits of democracy and fascism. Okay, I'll give you that. Well, what, how do you, on what basis do we decide some, which is, what, what, whether something is better or even worse? We tell ourselves stories about the consequences. I mean, when we think, hey, maybe constitutional government is breaking down, maybe we better find the strong men, we tell ourselves stories about what happened to countries that had strong men. Uh, I think that most of most political persuasion is done by narratives of saying, "Look, remember what happened when they did this," or "Look, look what could ha what might happen in the future if we did that." Uh, when you go philosophical and try to step back from the narratives to the principles, I think political discourse decays. Uh, I would prefer to stick to the narrative. Okay. Well, let's say a narrative about affirmative action. There's a debate going on in the country right now about. Um, whether this is really good for us or we should get rid of it. Um, and you know, both sides make reasonable claims, but how do we adjudicate between these? I mean, how do we decide? I think it's much like the abortion issue. You know, we uh, the side that's, that is trying to change the institution as the abortion advocates were trying to change the traditional customs in some cases laws, is saying, look, the way things are going, uh, there's injustice and an unhappiness. The advocates of affirmative action have narratives about what it's like to grow up a descendant of the slaves in a country that has always made the blacks um, last hired, first fired, and so on, and saying, look, to be Americans requires giving these people some kind of compensation. Uh, that worked remarkably well for a generation. I mean, you might, in, in a way, it's a miracle that it ever worked. I mean, it's a miracle that the whites were able to say, yeah, you, know, you got a point there. <laughs> and in effect, accept, that, accept the fact that whites would be at a disadvantage in certain situations for a while. That seems to be breaking down. You know, I hope it won't break down, but I haven't got any neat argument about, you know, when it's when affirmative action is okay, when it isn't okay, and so on. I just sort of hope that the country will still feel enough generosity to realize that's you know mm -hmm. here we brought these people over as slaves, and it's still time to do something about it. There's a radically different kind of culture war is what's going on right now in Afghanistan, with the Taliban coming in and imposing this really severe Islamic law on a country in which some of the people might consider themselves uh, heirs of the Enlightenment tradition who've gone to uh, universities and become well-educated, women included, who are now being told they have to stay home. If they leave the house, they have to be covered head to toe. Now here certainly we have a clash of cultures and it's only being, one side's being maintained simply by force. Um, what do you, I mean, do you see any kind of hope for a situation like that apart from force? Yeah, I, I, I have no no real grasp of Islamic fundamentalism. I mean, it's a, it seems tremendously powerful all of a sudden. I, you know, I wish I had a better sense of where it came from, but I honestly have no idea. I mean, it, it, you're, you're right. It's a perfectly straightforward clash between everything the Enlightenment stands for and something you know, sort of out of the dark ages. And I don't see that philosophy or anything else much helps you find a, you know, f could help these people find a common ground. Yeah. In fact, at one point you, um, in one essay, say that those people who seem to be enemies of liberal democracy, all we can say about them is that they're mad, really. No, I, I, I think that what, what I meant in that passage was just at a certain point you realize that conversation isn't paying off, that you'll just never get anywhere by talking. Mm -hmm. And the philosophical tradition, the Plato-Kant tradition, suggests, no, actually, if you do keep talking, there's something deep in each of you that will respond, and eventually you will come out at the same place. This seems to me just false. I mean, it would be yeah. nice if there were something deep in every human being that would lead them to the same moral conclusion, but I think human beings are creatures of their cultures. You can raise them fascists, you can raise them fundamentalists, you can raise them liberal democrats. I hope we can raise more people to be liberal democrats, but I can't, you know, 
I can't offer something common to all human beings which provides the premise of an argument that they ought to be liberal Democrats. But so many people have, be have changed their views because of conversation. Sure, and it may happen again. Uh, you know, maybe the children of the Taliban people will read books about the Enlightenment, uh, and someday there'll be something like an Islamic Enlightenment. You know, mm -hmm. stranger, well, thi stranger are, things have happened. Uh, we certainly have um, liberal Islamic countries like Turkey and, and others that, oh, you know, believe us that there should be a public space separate from yeah. the religious private space. Right. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, again, uh, you know, we. Th we thought Algeria was going to be like Turkey, and it looks as if it isn't going to be like Turkey. And you know, none of us predicted either <laughs> what's happening in Afghanistan or what's happening in Algeria. Yeah. Let's switch to uh, talk about human nature a little bit. Um, I know that well, you've written an essay that's very, very compelling about that we should put, we shouldn't bother ourselves with talk about what kind of the nature of human beings when we're trying to talk about the nature of our political societies. That we should talk about democracy without having to worry about what sorts of human beings we are. But it seems like that with students, for example, you know, talk to students about what communism might be. And the first thing that they'll jump up and say is, no, human beings aren't like that. Human beings are too selfish to go along with um, communism. Or you talk about anarchy. Human beings are too uh, greedy or power hungry to go along with that. It seems, too, that, that, that claims about um, constitutional democracies do rest on certain claims of what, what kind of kind of human nature we have. Well, the Enlightenment tried to rest them on claims about human nature, but I don't think it's it succeeded in doing so. And I think th there's this poem by Charlotte Perkin, Gil Perkins Gilman, an early feminist, called "You Can't Change Human Nature." Uh, you know, that the, the the substance of the poem is. When the first fish crawled out of the out of the sea, the other fish said, "Come on, you can't change your nature." You know, we've been changing our you know evolution has been changing the nature of organisms all this time. Culture has been changing the nature of human beings all this time. You know, the the whole idea of a permanent human nature seems to me, you know, um, a myth that's outlived okay. its usefulness. Okay, all right. So, so yeah. human nature varies with cultures, right? So it seems like that's well, all the more well, reason to look at that relationship between what kind of society produces what kinds of people. Yeah. Um, that's about all there is to, you, to look at, namely human history instead of human nature. And yeah. I mean, human history is a matter of narratives. Human nature is presumably an object of theory. We keep hoping somebody will come up with a theory of human nature, and it doesn't happen, and I think we might as well abandon the hope, stick to the narrative. Well, if human beings are a product of their culture, it seems like the kind of judgments that they make are only going to be as good or bad as the kind of culture that they came from. Okay. But there are, you know, there are people who are always slightly ahead of their culture. Jefferson was ahead of the American culture of his time. Christ was ahead of the culture of his time. Socrates was ahead of the culture of these times. Occasionally, one of these geniuses has ideas that people pick up and run with. We don't know why that happens. Or how they became geniuses, how they got ahead of their culture. Oh, you know, maybe a cosmic ray hit their neurons. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't really matter how uh -huh. they became geniuses. It isn't that we're going to get a recipe for making geniuses. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a piece that you did for the New York Times a year ago, and I don't know quite how to describe it. It was kind of a... a fictional history or semi-fictional yeah, the history? The Times asked for that. They They asked for a bunch of papers from a bunch of articles from different people about uh, how things will look a century from now at the end of the 21st century. So I dutifully wrote a paper about it. Yeah, it was, it was very nice. There was a, you kind of predicted what will happen down the road, the history mm -hmm. of this century, the past two centuries, and then some predictions that uh, with the class divisions, the disparity growing between yeah. the people, professional wages and those whose wages are sinking towards the minimum, how there'll be eventually a class war kind of predict, yeah. I thought, sort of fanciful, but not entirely, yes. um, a revolution in 2014, followed mm -hmm. by military rule, mm -hmm. and finally a, f a re of democracy. Mm -hmm. But this time, instead of being based upon, you know, valuing rights, it would be based upon a fraternity or fellow yeah. feeling. Well, what I had in mind was the, the rhetoric of the progressive movement in America around 1910. 
was against the idea that the essence of America is the individual against the state and the preservation of the rights of the individual against the state. The progressives said, for the 19th century, individual rights were enough. We got to have something different. In the face of industrial capitalism, we got to form a new kind of democratic community in which it's the our responsibilities to each other rather than our individual rights that matter. And I think they were right, and the left in America, you know, did help develop a kind of sense of community which didn't exist in 19th century America. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that came to an end in the 60s. Uh, I hope it comes back. We've got about one more minute. What can we do now to forestall uh, revolution in the streets and in another 20 years? I mean, how Re can we redistribute, switch directly? Redistribute the wealth. I mean, uh, uh, let, the, let the suburbanites be taxed to pay for inner city schools. Uh, lower the wages of the professors, the executives, and the lawyers so that you can raise the minimum wage, stuff like that. You know, just the plain, ordinary redistributionist solutions. Wow, I haven't heard someone say that in a long time. It's no, wonderful. I'm a tax and spend it's a wonderful. Yes. It's wonderful to hear. Well, yeah. thank you yeah. so much, Prof yeah. Professor Rorty, for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thank you.